trying to study in your uh, parts of the human being, parts and planes of being, if you like to put it more correctly, parts and planes of being of human consciousness. That is what we are trying to study. Well, where are those people? They're not yet come. Uh, they walked right down here just a minute ago. They'll be right here, I think, right? No. They, they stop came, for a minute. They a mixed operation, very complex movement, and there is not one movement which is not connected with all the others. That is, when you say principle of mind, well, mind penetrates right up to the constitution of the body, so that physical consciousness is also influenced by mind. So, so as mind is influenced by the body and the vital consciousness of life, well, all functions of human psychology are uh, so intermixed that you cannot uh, cut them into, uh, you know, analytical divisions. We have been trying to study functions of human psychology or human psychological parts and planes of being. Well, today is, uh, yesterday we have finished something with regard to the consciousness and also with regard to vital being. These two we had covered yesterday and we also made a little attempt at knowing what is mind. Men generally mix up when they talk or think or try to experiment with psychology by not being able to separate the functions in their original working. For instance, many people say uh, they can't distinguish between vital and mind. Activity of the vital being in themselves and activity of mental being in themselves. They always mix up and say it is all mind. Now this is not at all true. As a matter of psychological fact, mind is quite an independent entity and can act independently though it can be influenced by the vital, influenced by the body, but mind has its own special separate function. So has the heart or the emotional being. The emotional being is not, you cannot call it intellectual being. So vital being also you cannot call vital being the same as intellectual being. The function of the vital being, the life energy working in man as a personality, is quite different. And that is, we drew a distinction when we were talking before I went for Los Angeles and so on, that mind if you want to know, well, in a short span you can say, Whenever something and you say, I want to know, well, that is mind. If somebody in you says, I want to have, well, it's vital. I want to do, it's vital. But I want to know the truth, well, it's my mind. It's very simple to know if one just distinguishes the, the operations of his energy of psychological or consciousness when it operates. Now, we have gone into a great deal of detail about it, so I don't want to repeat. Now, today I am giving one schema to make the relation of this nature, personality or nature functioning in man with his true entity, true personality, psychic being. In psychological studies, there is a great confusion because their idea is that psychology must proceed experimentally. Now, that is itself a very, very incorrect and half-correct attitude. It's not true. Uh, you can't experiment in psychology in the same way as you can experiment with physics or chemistry. It is not possible because the two, uh, so the subject matter is not the same. And uh, yet they insist and therefore they can't arrive at a psychological entity, the true soul personality. For that they have to make a they too round about and then say there is a uh, collective unconscious and from the collective unconscious you go into depth psychology in the depth psychology there is a psych all is more or less attempted knowledge without any direct experience it is very unfortunate and sherundo wrote this when he wrote when we began this discourse i quote his sentence if you remember that psychology is a subjective science in which you proceed from the knowledge of yourself to the knowledge of others. And all the psychologies that write today proceed from with the knowledge of others. Probably I don't know whether they arrive at any knowledge of themselves that I don't know. You see, but they don't, uh, they don't proceed from the knowledge of themselves to the knowledge of others. That is the base of psychology. 
if you do not know who you are, how are you going to know what all other human beings are? And this is the very greatest difficulty, but it is an age of freedom and some experiment is always good, some knowledge is attained, some smattering of it is all right. But it doesn't go to the root of the problem. Now, you, do you take the functions. Now, this is the result of hundreds of years of experience, this analysis or this division of planes and parts of human psychology into mind, emotional being, vital being, nervous being, physical being, and subconscious. This is as old as the hills of the Himalayas. It is not new at all to any Indian. Absolutely, it is known for thousands of years. Only this classification and clarity about it well, was organized and synthesized and brought into expression by Sri Aurobindo. But the facts of it were known to people for many years. They knew that when you want to do bhakti or devotion, you must develop and try to enlarge your emotional being. When you want to do the yoga of jnana or knowledge, you must expand and, and you know, develop your intellectual or mental being, <clears throat> intellect or buddhi. And by widening of buddhi and perception, quieting and control and concentration, you can arrive at the perception of unity which is pervading all, the, all over the world. So these things were well known. This organization of psychology and its expression for the modern world is the contribution of Sri Aurobindo because he divested all the systems of yoga of their local character, of their traditional color, of the ceremonies and, and, and outer paraphernalia, which is inevitably connected with all these past systems of yoga. Well, he arrived at this generalization. You see, on the top there is a mind. Now, mind is not even one level of being. Yesterday only we had this vital mind, physical mind, and pure mind. Is it not? Yes. Now, that division we have finished, so I won't, don't want to repeat. Now, in the mind, therefore, there are three layers. For your general information, you can say pure mind, pragmatic mind, practical mind. Now, pure mind is a mind that wants to know the truth. It says, I want to know what is the truth of anything. As soon as anything presents itself, the first function of pure mind is to ask, what is it? What is the truth about this? So, if a desire comes before you, a public question comes before you, a bill in the parliament comes before you, when the pure mind acts, it says, what is the truth? What is to be done? And why I have to do what I am going to do? Well, that is a function of pure mind. That means your pure, pure mind is active. But if at that time, if a desire comes and you say, oh, this is all right, then your pure mind is absent. It is not working. You understand? The, the whole thing is, the, the, yes, pragmatic mind is a mind that is concerned with the practical application of a truth. So if you say, yes, to be honest is very good, but then you say, but in the practical situation, when I'm in business world, oh, you see, I have to, oh yes, that is not pure mind, it is pragmatic mind. Trying to compromise with the, with the surrounding, you see, trying to make a sort of a compromise. This is a pragmatic mind, mind that tries to look at how truth will be applied and the limitations of application of pure truth to life. Practical mind is mind that is swayed by physical surrounding and admits only the physical as the real. It, it only is not concerned with any truth or implication of truth, it is only concerned with, well, some details of life. It has nothing to do with, uh, with anything of the truth at all. Now, another function, we, another division which we had done was different, vital mind and physical mind and pure mind. Well, now this mind, today we are taking up the subject of mind for the time being. Afterwards we will come to this again. This is a current conception in modern times all over the world, not only in America and Europe, but all over the world, that by mind, operating on the data that is given to it, man will be able to solve his problem. If any problem is given, the general idea is that mind will be able to tackle this problem. Now, this is partly true that mind does tackle the problem, only it doesn't solve it. It tackles the problem because it tries to tackle, but doesn't solve the problem. And this is not perceived because 
people think that no we are tackling the problem we are tackling next step we'll tackle next step we'll tackle but that is the law of the mind that is the functioning of the way of the mind what is mind and there Sayarunga gave a very wonderful fine definition he said that mind is ignorance seeking for knowledge mind is ignorance seeking for knowledge so it cannot possess knowledge inherently by its own right no it is not not that that is not given to it by nature it is ignorance seeking for knowledge so when mind is ignorant seeking for knowledge when it arrives at some further step the area of the known to the mind when it increases at each point the area of the unknown also touches it you see you will see it at a very simple illustration if i give uh, additional here this is supposing here is the mind working and mind knows this arc now mind says i will enlarge my area and when it has enlarged area here at this area at every point the unknown or the unknowable is touching when mind has known this much this is known the unknown is here now when the known is increased the unknown also is correspondingly increased isn't it this was the known area so the unknown was touching it at all points here now the known is increased this is now the known you see you take it off so this is now the known well the unknown is touching at all the points isn't it this is simple very very ordinary to it's like mathematics you see because <laughs> formally you uh, one did not know uh, for instance uh, people said that oh now the cure of dysentery is not known all right now cure of dysentery is found then how does now oh the germs of dysentery the, there is a lot of other things also found with it is it not so what to do with these germs of dysentery now and how to deal with them well, the unknown is touching at every point. The point of advance of the known always is touching the unknown at all the points because what is to be known is infinite. What is to be known is not a problem. What is to be known is absolutely unlimited infinity. How is mind going to tackle this infinity? Because the more it goes, the infinity will touch with the, as the unknown at every point. You see, if... <laughs> <clears throat> when there was no machinery, then people thought that now science is, has found out, uh, you know, processes and, and industry and uh, people have found out machinery. So a lot of things will be produced and there will be no want in humanity. A lot of things was produced and want remained. And Carlyle put like that, Carlyle in his time and those writers at the time when machinery was, the industrial revolution was on in England, you see, that you said that cloth, when you produce by machinery, everybody will get cloth, but cloth is stacked in the machinery and, and in, the, in the go downs and people are without cloth. <laughs> so how production is done, the distribution, then, oh, now the problem is, not only to produce but to distribute yes so you got another problem you see then he said yes product production and distribution is all right but now the industrial people say that why should one man become rich at the expense of others oh so there is labor and capital you see not only production and distribution this was not there before the known is increased the unknown is coming at every point do you understand this, this, this is inevitable. You can't help. This is the structure of the mind. What is mind, as I told you? It is ignorance seeking for knowledge. And what is to be known is infinite. Mind has no power to tackle the infinite. It grasps like that to hold the whole, fails completely. You cannot see. Why go further with mind? Sight is given and man can't see two miles ahead. So he has to devise the instrument by which he increases the capacity of his sensation. The same he does with his capacity to understand and grasp. Very limited apparatus is given to man in the mind. And with this mind, if he is trying to tackle this object of knowledge, means the universe, that is the object of knowledge, is it not? Well, then this object of knowledge is infinite. 
mind has no capacity to take hold of it in one bound or in one clasp. So what it does is that it acts as a power of division. It divides and slices, it cuts parts in the whole, in the infinite. And each part it tries to reduce to manageable size and then study it, observe, or experiment, arrive at some sort of scientific attitude, you know, and make a science out of it with conclusions and so on. It works hard at that point. There is no doubt that mind is very sincere as far as it goes. But the claim of the human being or the belief in human in humanity that intellect or mind will solve problem is a half truth. You must try to solve problem, it is true. One must not say that because mind is an incapable or an imperfect instrument, therefore we shall not use it. No, one has to use it. Sherundo says that what you have to do is to know its limitations. You know how far it can go and where it cannot be taken as a guide and as a as a as a judge, so to say, because there are realms in which mind will not be able to operate easily. So it is better to know what mind can do. Well, mind can divide. Mind can cut things into parts. Mind can observe, watch, experiment, compare, contrast arrive at conclusions, apply what knowledge it has attained to life and either invent, create new things. Well, mind can do many operations, but all that it does will amount to a representation of truth, not truth itself. Not the truth itself, but a construction of truth. Mind says, I know. What does it know? Its own analysis of the object, its own sensation of the object, its own, uh, you know, judgment. When it says, I know matter, what does it mean to say? I know my own analysis of matter, not matter. I know my own generalizations of matter, not matter. It knows its own construction. It makes a structure in the intellect and says, a generalization, a principle, this is so. That is what it knows, not what is happening there. This generalization is based on what it observes outside, certainly. But the knowledge that is constructed here has a, not a relation of truth to its expression, no. It's a representation of truth, a construction of truth. You see, it is like a symbol. It is like a symbol. What happening is there is X. The knowledge in the mind is, is something Y. You see, and there is a relation between this X and Y, but the X and Y is not necessarily identical or equivalent. No. This is, this is to be understood and clearly, you know, well, driven home before we fully understand the functioning of the mind. Because mind is a capacity, mind is a function or power of the consciousness to divide, to specialize, to analyze, then to cut into parts and deal each part as if that was the whole. This is what the mind always does. Take, take the whole into bits or parts and then deal each part as if it was a whole. And there it arrives at some understanding, some you know, practical dealing with what it analyzes, but it doesn't arrive at the knowledge of you know, the thing that it only arrives at a construction of it, as a representation, a symbolic way of putting. In mathematics you say x plus y, but it represents something else. It's a symbol, it's not the thing, it's not knowledge. It is expression of knowledge in symbols. I give you one instance, for instance, how reality or truth and the expression of it in mind or intellectual way in which it is put are not the same. It is only a construction, a representation, and a symbol. If you have a map of New York, even when a very correct map of New York, it is not New York. So, yes. Now, when you are very exact and very conscientious, you can make it to scale even. And you can say, this is very correct. This is New York. It is 
a symbol of New York, not New York itself. And with that, if you go to New York, you might lose your way. Because if you don't know how to read and how to apply it, well, actual New York might so overcome you that you might lose your way, knowing having a good map with you. So that intellectual expression is only a representation of the reality as mind has perceived it and expressed it in ideas and language. That is all that mind can do. More than that to express, expect from mind, expect from mind is to expect it to do the impossible. Therefore, mind is not the faculty which will radically solve the problem. It will always try to attempt to solve the problem because it is its business. It is its nature to try to go forward with the details and say, I will solve, I will solve. But every time it tries to solve, what it does is to increase the area of the loan, little area of the known with the result that unknown also is equally increased. So that mind always, when it tries to solve or actually solves a problem, the general result is that it creates one, two, five, ten, or twenty problems more. That's all. It is all right. One problem is solved, but then there is another. And there is, it says, now I will take up that now. But it is an unending, you know. It is like C.C. was being tempted, 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 but it never arrives at the root. Root problem of man, therefore, is this very division of the mind. That is the problem. That is itself. Mind itself is an instrument of division, and it is the cure lies in curing this division. The power of division of the mind has to be changed into a power of unity. And when mind even arrives at knowledge, it arrives only always by, uh, you know, taking many facts and arriving at unity. Even in the mind, when it first divides the object of knowledge, it takes the whole universe and cuts matter. And then matter is studied. When it is studied matter, it takes facts of life, facts of matter, and makes a law. That is making again unity. So that when it arrives as effective knowledge, even limited knowledge which is effective, it is always by attaining a unity. It arrives and tries to arrive at a harmony and unity on its own basis of division. And so far as it succeeds, it attains power. Whatever knowledge it has becomes power because naturally it's a knowledge of the unity. Well, this mind, we have tried to just see some functioning of the mind is, uh, as I put to you, ignorant seeking of knowledge. And it's not a faculty which possesses knowledge in its own inherent right. It's a faculty which seeks knowledge and expresses the knowledge as much as it can when it gains it. When it begins that which it does not know and tries to know and which never knows except in a glass darkly. It's a reflective mirror which receives presentations or images of pre-existent truths and pre-existent facts. What does it know when it comes to know? It doesn't create anything new. It knows what was there. When somebody said that the sun goes round the earth and earth, uh, you see, uh, it was corrected by saying, no, the earth goes round the sun. Nothing new was done. If a truth was pre-existent and mind only came to know about it, that's all. It has created nothing. When you say, oh, now we are trying to study the constitution of organic compound. But the con constitution already exists. When you discover it, it is there already. It is not as if mind did something. Well, Columbus discovered America, but he did not create America. America was there before Columbus discovered it, is it not? Well, the same way, whatever truth is discovered in chemistry or physics is already pre-existent there. It is not as if mind created something which didn't exist. It's not possible for mind to do that at all. <laughs> mind cannot do it. You cannot. <laughs> it was there already, therefore you took advantage of it and said, ah, it is there. And you showed it. And even then when you show it, it is not as you show it perhaps. You discovered a side of it, an aspect of it, a portion of it, a, a limited you know, view of it. And you put it uh, to you because it is, it is not creation of anything new. This is one thing to be noted with regard to the capacities of mind. It can conceive with precision divisions and treat divisions as if they were real. Each division it treats as if it was real. 
and therefore it arrives at a very you know, um, detailed knowledge about the things that it divides. It cannot, it can also conceive a synthetic whole and total, put parts together and construct a whole and try to make up a constructed synthesis or a whole. But the ultimate unity and absolute infinity are to mind abstract notions. Mind cannot, you say ultimate reality, mind says no. It is a reality which my thought or conception represents. If you say absolute uh, infinity, then it says, well, it's a concept. What is absolute infinity? To the mind, it is only an abstraction. It is not something real. Mind is an instrument of analysis and synthesis, but not of essential knowledge. Its function is to cut something from the whole unknown and call this delimitation the whole. And it knows the separate objects and as a part of the whole. But it knows its own analysis only of the object. The mission of mind is to train our obscure consciousness to enlighten its blind instincts. This is the great service which mind has rendered to humanity, to the human being. That when mind came on the scene, before the mind was there, there was a working of impulses, blind instincts, superstitions, false ideas, half-truths, which uh, you know people uncivilized believe to be the final truth. When mind dawned on the scene of human evolution, then mind corrected all the mistakes of the, of the impulsive life of man, instinctive life of man, of uh, the superstition, superstitious life of man, and it organized well, and trained the human being to get out of random movement of intuition, vague perceptions, and it becomes capable of a greater light if you allow the mind to seek the light. Ultimately, mind itself can become an instrument of a greater light. The only difficulty is that mind has to be persuaded to accept its own limitations. This some minds easily do. There are intellects that easily admit the limit to which intellect must be trusted and allowed to go. More than that, they would themselves say mind is not capable of. It's not an instrument which can go further. Well, then it can render a very effective service and it shall be ready to receive the higher light, which is beyond mind. It is to train the mind to understand its own limitation that this aspect of limitation of mind is given. It is not to say that reason has not rendered great service to man and cultural progress of even humanity. A great progress, as he himself points out, these are almost the words of Sri Aurobindo, which I just quoted, that it's, it has trained the human mind, uh, you know, to, from the obscure consciousness to enlightenment, to refuse and to reject blind instincts, random intuitions and vague perceptions. And if it is trained, it can become capable of accepting a greater light than itself. Therefore, the thing to be remembered is that mind is a passage to something beyond mind. This is an important, uh, you know, uh, corollary. That mind is not a place of rest. Mind is not uh, ultimately a full point of a process. Mind is a passage. It is not a culmination of a process, but a passage. You have to go up to mind and then go beyond mind. This is one important conclusion which we must remember that mind is only a temporary stage or a passage through which the human consciousness has to pass to a greater light beyond mind. The mind is, why mind is so limited? Because mind is embedded in matter. Mind has to work in a material medium. Mind is limited by the inconscious inertia and unconsciousness of matter. Therefore, uh, mind is, is not able to act freely even as it would be able to act if it was not limited to material media. It is limited in brain, in, in sensations, eyes, ear, uh, capacity to see, to hear, to touch, to smell. Well, all these being limited, uh, the range of mental capacity gets a limitation. Then, it is a consciousness that measures, that limits and cuts forms of things from the indivisible whole and contains them as if each were a separate integer. It can conceive, perceive and sense things, but rigidly cut out from the background. 
and this is the greatest uh, you know service at the same time the highest limitation of mind perception conception and sensation is there but this is isolated from the conception perception and sensation of the whole the 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 first dictum is forgotten that mind is out to study and know the universe and universe has to be known as a whole you cannot separate the you cannot have the quality and property or powers of the whole in its parts parts cannot reveal the whole this is one of the uh, dictums of latest one of the latest school of psychology gestaltism it is called in that they say that the property or quality of the whole is not possessed by the parts you take a table i gave you the instance when you were dealing with psychology you take a table and take it to parts and have a board and three or four legs lying there and call a man who has never seen a table and say what is this then he will say this is a piece of wood this is a piece of plank he, he won't understand that uh, this is a whole is it not he must have the whole before in his mind in order to construct out of three or four legs and one body table the concept of the table as a whole is that which is not possessed the property is not possessed by the legs or by the board you understand you take music now uh, each note when it is sung or each line or each note when it comes out is replete with the power of the whole if you isolate this do re ma fa sol sa and sing it it won't have that effect is it not because the 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 the, the succession of notes carries the effect of the totality the whole theme each note is charged with the whole theme the whole is in each therefore you enjoy the music as it comes and what you notice is of course uh, you know particular succession of notes what what you really enjoy really is the the delight of the whole the harmony of the total and the harmony of the total though it is not expressed in sound yet every succession of note or every you know bar that you hear carries the whole the 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 the, the vibration of the whole naturally it is it is not the notes only certainly not well if the theme is of a certain vibration the every note of the theme also carries the the impression of the vibration of the whole it is not isolation isolated it will not be able to produce the same effect well the quality of the whole is not always shared by the quality of the parts and that is what happens to all mental knowledge that mind is not it cuts this universe is living it's pulsating it is conscious but when it is cut into parts mind takes it as if it was dead inert unconscious naturally you see you have lost the one most important item of the knowledge that you are dealing with a living universe but that is gone when mind has taken up the problem the very fundamental aspect of the cosmos is forgotten that it is a living universe one universe you have cut it into parts how can you divide the matter from the living world which depends on matter comes out from matter lives on matter thrives on matter out of that plethora of living whole living energy of universal expression mind comes into being all is one mind depends on life mental consciousness involved in man depends on life life depends on matter all is one indivisible and yet when mind takes up the problem the universe becomes inert you see how much immediately is lost when the 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 the, the problem in its totality is regarded as if it was to be known by dividing it into infinitesimal innumerable parts so that is what you the intellectual operation does with all it is a good thing because we have come out from the primitive stage of the barbarians of african tribes perhaps or the red indians here and have organized ourselves have you know put some discipline into our instinctive life try to understand 
ourselves and try to more create values, moral values, intellectual values, idealistic values. And so we have arrived at some point of progress, some point of culture. But to say that we will be able to take mind to the highest possible fulfillment of man is to expect too much from mind and intellect, you see. Intellect yet can render a great service by accepting its limitation and opening to something greater than itself. If intellect can be persuaded to accept that it is a passage, that it's a temporary stage and a greater stage or a higher stage beyond mind is also possible if that could be given to mind, which it can be. If mind is sincere, it could immediately accept it. It is only when the mind is overweening and very full of pride for itself and then very egoistic, you see, and doesn't want to, uh, to admit a greater reality than itself. Then only it limits the progress of man's knowledge towards a greater light than mind. And there is a fear also in man's mind that if I give up mind, uh, how do I know that I will get something by which my problem will be solved? This is another danger and difficulty. And so long as we are accustomed to a limited process of successful application, we go on applying it and saying, but uh, you don't want to invite something which might be perhaps unknown, or the consequence of it are not never known. You see, if you are accustomed to send uh, telegraph by wires only, copper wires, then you will be afraid of trying uh, you know, wireless telegraphy if you are not sure about it. You say, well, well, how that man says it's wireless, but how can message go from one to another point without wire? The same attitude mind is taking with regard to a greater reality beyond mind. It says, I give up what I know, and supposing I say I'm limited, then I might be completely lost. Well, it is just like the fellow saying, who knows how can be that be wireless uh, you know, <laughs> transmission of message from one point to another without wire? Well, mind has to admit a possibility it is not to take a, a irrational risk or a unthinking jump no but mind can rationally think out the, the, the logic of how far it can go and what would happen if a greater truth than mind was possible of attainment to human consciousness Human consciousness has attained up to the intellectual level, mental level. And now the idea is that this is summum bonum. Well, it is not. That is the whole thing. Mind is not the summum bonum of process of growth of man from a primitive state to the present civilized condition. You see? Well, a greater uh, cultural step is possible for man by making a movement beyond intellect. Well, mind is capable of conception, perception, and sensation, but it is done on the base of rigid cutting out from a big and vast background. And it employs all that it cuts as fixed units. And uh, mind divides, it can multiply, it can add and subtract, but it cannot go beyond the limit of its mathematics. This was a claim of mathematicians once upon a time, and even now I think extreme mathematical, you know, philosophers always say that the highest reach of human intellect is mathematics. In one sense, it is true. Abstraction. Whatever you study, you, you reduce into a formula which is impersonal and applicable to all conditions, and it is the, it is the smallest expression of vast number of facts. Gravitation, you see, you innumerable facts it reduced to a small formula mathematically. Um, the, the physics or chemistry, very small formula, and all the facts are afterwards well uh, concentrated in that small formula. But in mathematics, you don't get anything that is not there. It is only what is that you get. What happens? What is? Or what? Or what you observe? It is not as if it was some something which was new. No. It is not. It can't create. It's like a mill. I told my friend who was great advocate of mathematics. It's like a mill. So you put in one end something, at the other end a formula comes out. That's all. You put all the end, on the other end the mill grinds and grinds. On the other end you get a formula, but you don't get anything more than what you put in. 
you get in at the other end just what you put in and he will say exactly as you put in nothing more only its form is now a tabloid form or a small equation or a formula mind cannot possess the infinite and that is its problem what it vaguely possesses is only vastness or some conception of vastness but it cannot possess the infinite in its purity or in its completeness it can be possessed by it which is quite another matter our mind's own true function is to translate always infinitely into the terms of the finite and to measure off and limit and decrease the infinite. This is its proper function. Mind's function is always to translate infinity into finiteness, to take up the infinite and turn it into finite, to uh, in, reduce it in measure it off, to limit and to decrease. It does not actually, without the sense of it does this process of taking the infinity and reducing it to finite terms without knowing the infinite. Mind is therefore the knot of ignorance, tie of ignorance. And this separated mind perceives only the particular and not the universal. And it does not perceive the particular and the universal as phenomenon of the infinite. Now, that was one aspect of the psychological function that we wanted to tackle this evening. Second is with regard to, well, the subconscious. But before I come to the subconscious, now I want to make the schema a little more clear to ourselves first. We dealt with the vital all right on one of our evening talks. This vital is centered on the navel. You see, that is the center of the vital. This is the emotional center. This is the vital center. This is the physical center at the end of the spinal column. And head or mind is divided into its three activities, the higher, the middle, and the lower mind. Now, this, all these are only instruments, mind and vital and the physical or body. These are instrumental operations or instrumental, you know, nature. The true entity or the true divine being in man is the psychic being. The soul, as you like to call it, you see, the psychic being. And it is really the psychic being which is the true personality behind the egoistic, mental, vital or physical personality of man. Man thinks that his personality is a great asset. It is. But his personality of nature, his nature personality, the intellectual or mental personality, emotional personality or vital personality, is a creature of nature, a surface play of a deeper being. And the deeper being in man is his soul, the psychic being or the soul entity in him. And it is the soul which really, well, from behind, tries to govern mind, tries to govern his emotional being, govern his vital being and govern his physical being. It is the, the, the representative of the higher consciousness in lower nature. Here you will see that this psychic being which I represented there is, has the capacity to open directly to the truth which is above. It can open directly to the truth. Here is a region of truth beyond mind, a region of higher consciousness if you like to call it for the sake of you know, giving it a name. Mind can open here by making an opening and accepting the truth. But the psychic has a direct approach all the time. The true soul entity in man is always open to the higher light beyond the attained range of evolution. In our evolutionary process, we have arrived at a stage where you can say that this is the universe as it is at present. In this universe, you can see mind is at the top. All this circumference of this is mind. Now, here is another potential universe. This is actual universe. Or you can say the attained process of evolution or universe as it actually exists. But there is a potential universe trying to contact and manifest itself here. So, if a quantity is established between the two, then the potential 
universe can penetrate here into this attained universe, if you like, attained cosmos. And the potential cosmos can add to the progress, the greatness, or the, 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 the growth of that which is actual. That is what now is the problem of man, how to allow the potential universe to influence this universe which is actual. In this process, the psychic being in man, his soul personality, soul entity, has to play a very definite part. In this process, the psychic being in man, his soul personality, soul entity, has to play a very definite part. Man is the representative of a spark of a divine consciousness. There is no man who doesn't hold in him the divine spark. The problem is how to govern his mind his emotional being, his vital being, his desired soul, his intellectual being, by the soul entity that is in him. If one can activate the soul entity in oneself, it would be able to first control the egoistic mental personality, the vital personality and its you know, subjection to impulses and, and desires and ambition and greed and selfishness and ego and all the limitations of human consciousness and bring about a harmony. Because that is in contact with the higher truth. It is directly capable of bringing the light, harmony and consciousness of the higher truth into mind, into emotional being, into the vital being. You understand? That is how it succeeds in creating first a control, in bringing about a control and afterwards in uh, creating a transformation of nature, human nature, into expression of the divine spark that is in man. Or that might be one way out of the present difficulty of man. Because man's difficulty, as we put on one of our talks, is not social problem, not economic problem, not political problem, but man is a problem. Problem is not social, educational, economic, or political. Problem is man. Man is the problem. And we have to tackle man. Man has to change. The idea that we will be able to change or man will be changed by constitution, by an institution, by social legislation or political uh, constitution, by law, is a chimera. It is a half-truth. It has never worked and it will never work. Because the problem is not social. It cannot be tackled by, from outside. It has to be tackled from inside at one stage. Mm -hmm. Problem is man and its present constitution. And is it possible for man to change? It is. Because in him is embodied a divine spark. There is no man without the divine spark in him. This is axiomatic almost, just like a point in geometry. The mathematicians may talk anything, but they've never seen a point. They say they built up all their geometry without knowing what is a point. <laughs> That's, a, that's it. That is just how you build up anything. Because on that you build, that is reality. It, it is on that your whole thing stands. On that you build a bridge now. Without seeing a point, you build a bridge all right. Yes. So it is because you or X or Y, Z does not perceive, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It is on that assumption you proceed, then you find it. Then you'll find it. This is not like science that even without knowing a point, you can build geometry. No. This is a point when you discover, you know that it is not a point. It is not a point. It is far, far more than a point. You see, that is the answer to it is in the light divine. You see, we are going through it, that it is the, the identity of this point with the cosmos and the identity of the cosmos with the transcendent. And this point is the representative of the transcendent light. It is not an insignificant or infinitesimal, uh, you know, point at all. It's a point which holds in it the, the whole uh, you know, substance of the infinite. This point embodies the whole of the infinite, potentially of the totality of the world, the universe. That is why Sri Aruno called uh, man or calls man in his great epic, uh, he's a, what is he? 
is a residue and a, you know, uh, he is a, uh, he is a, my son, a fragmented residue. Man is called a fragmented residue. He is a fragment of a total whole, which he doesn't know yet. He, but he is a, he, that fragment represents that whole. The fragment here is the fragment of the divinity. And he is the residue of a process in which all the elements of perfection are embodied. It is not a residue in which uh, you know, the fulfillment of man, any element of it is lacking. All the elements are present for him to make up the whole and to create the whole process of perfection and fulfillment in his life. Well, that is the, the function of the, of the psychic being in man. So we have therefore the mind, mental being, then the emotional being, the vital being, the nervous being and the physical being. That is the rung of the psychological ladder. And for each there is a uh, you know, generality of function. All are mixed, inextricably mixed, so mixed that you cannot divide mind from the vital, vital from emotion, and emotion from nerve, nerve from body. That is true. But general line when you try to observe, because in yoga, our interest in this is not academic. Our interest is practical. What we want to do is to understand the functioning of our inner parts so that we can know what is happening to us and what we want to do. You see, unless and until we know, it is difficult to... Uh, to tackle, so to say, the psychological movements in oneself. It is, our interest is rather directed to practice. So we want to understand, when we say, when a man says, I cannot concentrate, then he will find out why he is not able to concentrate. Then he said, my mind, it may not be your mind at all, it may be your vital which is disturbed and not mind. Mind may be quite quiet. Then, in that case, you can go to the mental level and establish peace there. And that peace you can slowly impose on the vital being. If you know the distinction between the vital and the mind. But if you do not know, all the time people say, my mind is disturbed. It's not mind at all. If you just watch yourself, you will see that mind is quiet. <coughs> and it is some portion of the navel region or region between the shoulder and the navel that is disturbed. You can clearly feel it. Absolutely, if you practice, you will clearly feel concentration somewhere either here or in the heart. The centers of concentration are well known, heart center and the mind center. So, whenever, wherever you center, you immediately know the distinction of functions that operate. Impulse that comes, comes always from below. Emotion that rise, rise generally from the white law of the emotional being. And <clears throat> idea when they come, true intellectual idea come always on the mental level, you see. So when we do understand, uh, take up the psychological observation of ourselves, then the knowledge of these parts helps us to locate the point of advantage or disadvantage in ourselves. Mm. There is a subconscious being below the physical, you see. We, so the physical is at the end of the spinal column, physical consciousness, the center of the physical consciousness. And all these are governed uh, really in, in birth by the psychic being. We will say something about the, the uh, subliminal, uh, the subconscious being. Before that, there is one aspect of it which has to be just a little noticed because there is a confusion in many people's mind about subliminal and the subconscious. Subliminal and the subconscious. Please note the distinction. Words are so similar that people mistake one for the other. Subliminal consciousness or subliminal mind, subliminal vital and subliminal nervous being are subtler parts of mind, emotional being and vital being, that are inner in their movement. Normally, mind, vital being, emotional being, is extroverted, turned outwards. Always the tendency of these faculties is to go out all the time. But there is a capacity in mind to go in. When the mind goes in, it goes into inner dimension of mental stuff, so to say. And when it goes into inner dimension of mental stuff, it arrives at powers which the extroverted mind hasn't got. 
range of subliminal mind is far greater than external mind. It is not intellect, mind that. It is because intellect is a rational mind turned outwards. These powers of the subliminal consciousness are not possessed by the waking consciousness of man, which is in 99.9 cases turned outwards. Mind, emotional being, vital being are generally turned outwards. They go out like that. And when they go in, then they go into an inner space or inner dimension of vital ether or vital being and then they come across powers which are not possessed by the outer vital being. Subconscious is not of the same type. Subconscious is below. It is lower. Subliminal is behind the veil. You follow the logic of this distinction? Subliminal is behind the veil. Subconscious is below the surface. If man is standing on uh, you know, surface of sea, Whatever is below the surface of sea is subconscious. But subliminal is that which is behind the way. For instance, when mind goes behind, when the mind goes behind, in the inner mental being, it has a range of knowing somebody's mind. You see? Without any, any communication from outside. Now this power in the subliminal mind, or when the vital goes inside, it is able to, you know, clairvoyance and clairaudience, understand and hear what somebody is saying somewhere else, thousands of miles away. These are powers of the subliminal, occult powers which are possessed by man's inner subtle body or subtle being. They are the subliminal powers. And the range of the subliminal is far wider than the range of either the vital or the mental being. I give the instance of one or two instances which I know, I mean, that um, mathematicians, when they have to calculate, they sit down and have to either devise a machine or do the work themselves, is it? There is a case of several people whom I know who have this subliminal capacity of, you know, getting the mathematical result without doing anything. So you, you put this question, in one minute the answer is there. It is only to go behind and look at the answer and give it out. That's all. Nothing. And this was done in England, not in India only. It was done before mathematical associations. I mean the towering mathematicians sitting and asking, yes, a figure of about 40 <laughs> numbers, you see. And you ask a square root, cube root, or something, or uh, some abstruse question of mathematics. You ask, immediately there is a reply. It takes, hardly takes two minutes. Now, this is not working out. This is not mind or intellect at all. In, they themselves had to understand this is not intellect. It can't be done mentally. It is a process of the subliminal power operating in the individual and a communication of the subliminal to the external. That is true. There are people, for instance, who read blindfold. You apply wheat flour, duff, wheat flour, you know, duff to the eye, and then he reads. And reads to a medical association, not reads to Tom, Dick, and Harry. He, he reads and, and shows that uh, eye is not uh, confined to this only. I can, it can see when there is an obstruction. And one striking instance was a cyclist who went blindfold on a cycle in Paris. Absolutely blindfold. Closed eyes on, on a cycle in Paris in, and through the so much traffic. Uh, that, is the, that is what I am, subliminal power of the vital. The vital being knows so what is obstruction, where to do, what to do, and guides him, and he accepts the guidance. If he believes his outer mind, he will fall at the first step. <laughs> he will what, have... what I mean, what... That is the explanation that the subliminal vital and subliminal mind have a range of power absolutely beyond the range of our senses. Yes, but I mean, why? Obviously, we, we all don't uh, do this, but why is this? Well, that because we don't use it. I mean, you see, if, if you touch the cow, she shakes her skin. If, if a primitive man will do that because he has retained. We have lost that. That's all. 
atrophy. We have not used the power. We are not, don't care. And scientists who tell you don't believe in it, they will say, even go to the extent of saying, don't be foolish. Because they don't like to believe what they don't know. <laughs> That's all. They were, they would say, oh, they all are nonsense, nonsense. They have been telling in spite of, you know, thousands of cases of telepathy. They have been studying now. These have been studying now for the last 50 years, not one or two days. And any number of instances are gathered in book. Evidence has been given. Witnesses have been given by most respectable person. And you go to the ordinary scientist. Oh, it's a oh, grandmother story. That's all. It is, they never want to believe or they don't want to. They don't know. They would never want to know. You know what? <laughs> they don't believe it. Evidence is there. I have got books written by American professors experimenting on telepathy, proving to the hilt that, uh, you know, the, the thing was done under proper conditions and without any, any, any other, uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, chance of uh, intervention by any authority, and still they don't admit. They don't want to admit that man has other powers. Why not? What is lost there? I don't understand. What is how we believe we have some powers which are not using? But which we may use or can use if we train or, or something happens and they awaken in us, there is no harm. But uh, that is where it is. Well, that is only the subliminal. Now, I, this makes point clear, a little clear. Before I go to the subconscious, I wanted to make this clear. That subliminal powers are not subconscious. They don't come from the subconscious being. Yeah. There is an inner as well as an outer consciousness all through our being. And upon all its levels, means physical level, vital level, intellectual level, emotional level. The ordinary man is aware only of his surface self and quite unaware of all that is concealed by the surface. This is from Sharundo's writing, you see. And yet, what is on the surface, what we know and what we think, what we know of ourselves and even believe that that is all we are, is only a small part of our being. It is a very small part of our being. And by far the larger part of it is below the surface in the subconscious and also behind the veil, subliminal, below the surface and more accurately it is behind the frontal consciousness, behind the veil, occult and known only by an occult knowledge. Modern psychology and psychic science have begun to perceive this truth just a little. Materialistic psychology calls this hidden fact inconscient, although practically admitting that it is far greater, more powerful and more profound than surface consciousness self of man. Very much as the Upanishad calls in us the superconscious self, the sleep self. It is not really a sleep, you see. Although this sleep self is said to be infinitely greater in intelligence, omniscient and omnipotent, it is called Pragna, the Ishvara. The psychic science calls this hidden consciousness subliminal self. And here too it is seen that this subliminal self has more powers, more knowledge and freer field of movement than the smaller self that is on the surface. But the truth is that all that is behind and this sea of which our waking consciousness is only a wave or a series of waves cannot be described by any one term for it is very complex. Part of it is subconscious, lower than our waking consciousness. Part of it is on the level with it and behind and much larger than it, part is above, superconscious to us. What we call our mind is only an outer mind, surface mental action, instrumental for a partial expression of a larger mind, behind of which we are not ordinarily aware and can only know by going inside ourselves. So too, what we know of our vital being in us is only outer vital being. The surface activity partially expressing the larger secret vital being which we can only know by going within. Equally, what we call our physical being is, is only a visible projection of a greater and subtler invisible physical consciousness, which is much more complex, much more aware, and much wider in its receptivity, and much more open and plastic and free. And that gives us some idea of the levels of consciousness which are not normally known to men. Now, I wanted to deal with the psychic being, but before that, for us, it is good to know about the 
subconscious being. Subconscious is not necessarily you know, the whole basis. In fact, subconscious depends upon the inconscient. The basis of the subconscious is really the inconscient. Inconscient is that which we can conceive of as something below matter even. Matter is something which to us is inert. Now, if you try to probe the constitution of matter, then you come to something which is not knowable by anything, inconscient. Matter, though not conscient, is an organized expression of something which is inconscient. Matter is something which we can know. If you try to say, now let us go below matter, then there you find something which you say, no, I can't lay my hold on anything. Because for us to lay hold on something, something must be their sensation or some object, is it not? Well, below matter there is no object. It's all inconscience. Therefore, Sherundo calls it inconscience. Yes, inconscience is the basis of subconsciousness. What we call subconsciousness is supported by this inconscient. So, whatever happens in man's mind is based on his brain. Then it has again gone down, vital, goes down to the nervous being, then to the matter, to bodily vibration, below bodily vibration. It has gone into the subconscious. Then that idea, thought, suggestion, impression, when you say, well, you go out in cold and you say, oh, I have gone out in cold. The conclusion is, therefore, I will catch cold. No? That's it. That's how life is. Uh, then you say, no, but I will take precaution not to catch cold. So you warm, you do this, all that. Yes, really, yes. But... The idea, the suggestion, the impression is supported not by mind, but ultimately by the inconscient below in the subconscious. The subconscious, you go back to unconsciousness and it is from there that the support to man's constant, you know, impressions, beliefs and, you know, suggestions is, is there. For instance, if you say disease can be eliminated, suddenly the whole mental being, the whole vital being and whole physical being say, oh no, how, 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 is it not? That's it. This is the operation of the subconscious. Now, there is no reason why disease cannot be eliminated. It can certainly be eliminated. You see, you put the idea that disease can be eliminated. A mind, vital, emotional, Physical being, no, no, how, impossible, can't be done. Well, the support of this is down below. Not only the support, it's inconscient. It is really below matter from where it says uh, matter cannot be changed. When you say, a man says, I want to change, but I can't change my nature. When he says, I can't change my nature, what he wants to say is that, well, I'm subject to the subconscious. That's all. I can't change. Who refuses? Go down, go down, go down. Then you say, oh, below consciousness from there a support has come. And below that is inconscient. And it says, I refuse to change. And it is that which is repeating here in the mind. I refuse to change. You see, the, the subconscious is the basis of habits. Constantly repeated beliefs, ideas for which there is no reason or logic, suggestions to which man is subject. You say disease can be eliminated. Well, so no. You can overcome fatigue. So no. But you yourself will see when there is a stress that fatigue is overcome. And to such an extent that you will be surprised. 
normally when you have to work, you can't uh, do a certain more than certain amount of work. But let there be a stress, an accident, somebody whom you like very much is sick, or a crisis is there and you, you know, you have to do. And you find that, well, no, it is very elastic. The, this, the, the, where is the limit? You see, but normally, when, all, all, no, this can't be done. This is like that. Well, this is that is how how people are repeating. A, a, you know, the the thing continues the same like that because of the subconscious. The world continues the same because of the subconscious refusal to change. That's all. And when a occasion arises or when the will rises to a pitch of you know intensity then the limit of the subconscious is overcome man is quite able to do absolutely without fatigue two nights you can go on working work three days without food and you are surprised how how he did manage he lives still there are people who have done like that you know wonderful uh, stamina and endurance i mean feats of, uh, of physical, apart from any mental or anything, physical, absolutely, and uh, staggering. Now, how does that happen if uh, the subconscious suggestion is the truth? Subconscious is the only suggestion. So this subconscious is a realm which has been very much now studied by modern psychologists also, and they have given it a more prominent place than in the scheme of yogic life. Because we do admit its great power. It is like a you know, iceberg that is hidden below. And uh, it is an iceberg where, that you don't see. Very little of man's consciousness is seen and much of it is below. And this below, what is governing his life, his ideas, his character, his actions almost. Because it, it refuses to change and man continues as he is. But to trace the whole of man's character and action to that is an exaggeration. It is powerful, no doubt. Its greatest power is over the body of man. Then less than that is on the vital being of man. And still less is on the mind of man. But still on the mind of man, the subconscious can have a very great hold. As, they, as it had on the primitive man's mind, you see. That uh, certain thing only can be done, other things cannot be done. Even mind can be governed. But when mind has become free, then the subconscious is not able to govern it to the extent that it is able to govern the body. Bodily consciousness being more near material, you know, matter and its uh, inertia, well, uh, the body easily admits the, the suggestion of the subconscious. The subconscious in our yoga we mean that quite submerged part of our being in which there is no wakingly conscious or coherent thought. In the subconscious, there is no thought. There is no will, feeling or organized reaction. But yet, it receives obscurely impressions of all things, stores them up in itself, and from it too, all sorts of stimuli, persistent habitual movements, crudely repeated or disguised in strange forms uh, can surge up into dream and into our waking nature. From the subconscious, into this dream or waking state. For if these impressions rise up most in dream in an incoherent and disordered manner, they also can and do rise into our waking condition, a waking consciousness, as a mechanical repetition of old thoughts, old mental, vital and physical habits, an obscure stimulus to sensations, actions, emotions, which do not originate in, in or from the conscious thought and will, and are even often opposed to its perceptions, to its choice and to its dictates. What the outer mind believes and wants to believe or thinks, the subconscious mind opposes and brings in just the opposite idea. You see? So that is what can happen even not only in dreams, but in waking condition. 
thinks just what the outer mind or vital doesn't admit or doesn't want to do, it comes. In the subconscious, there is an obscure mind full of obstinate impressions, associations, fixed notions, habitual reactions formed by our past. And obscure vital full of seeds of habitual desires, habitual sensations, nervous reactions, most obscure material which governs much that has to do with the conditions of our body comes from the subconscious. It is largely responsible for our illnesses, chronic or repeated. They are indeed mainly due to the subconscious and its obstinate memory. Bodily, you see, the organ remains the memory. And then it says, oh, I didn't get headache. You see, the, the, the nerve actually says, when headache is gone, oh, where is the headache? And it immediately comes back. <laughs> this is very strange. <laughs> it is like that, you see. You, you give up the habit of your smoking. What happens? The subconscious brings the impulse and absolutely when you are unaware, simply throws it like that and you say, oh, I didn't smoke. That's it. You see, no part of your conscious being was thinking at all. You can watch if you are careful. No part is thinking. And suddenly at one point it bursts out and oh, I didn't smoke. And if you say, oh, it is not good. I, I, I think it might have some reaction. Immediately there will be a reaction also in the nerves or in the in the vital being or somewhere and you will feel uneasiness in the headache or nervous system or something and you will say, oh, it is because of that. So if I smoke, this will go. Well, it is that is the play of the subconscious. That's all. It's nothing else. You only need to persist and you will see that it's a play of the subconscious. There is no truth in it at all. But uh, people actually are governed in their conduct by this. Actually, there is no theory about it. You know, see, it must... Uh, impress upon the body consciousness, you know, obstinate memory and the habit of repetition of whatever has impressed itself upon the body consciousness. But this subconscious must be clearly distinguished from the subliminal parts of our being, such as the inner and subtler physical consciousness, inner vital and inner mental consciousness. For they are not at all obscure and incoherent or irorganized, but only veiled from our surface consciousness. Our surface constantly receiving something now, inner touches and communications and influences from these sources, but it doesn't know, you know for the most part from whence they come. When a poet or an artist or an occultist or a clairvoyant suddenly knows, if he's trained, he knows from where it is coming. But otherwise, a poet or a, a intuitive worker doesn't know from where he is receiving. It may be subliminal mind which is communicating with him without his knowing. It happens in some cases where the individual doesn't know the origin from where he is receiving some operation of the occult power of the subliminal. The subconscious is universal as well as individual, like all other main parts of our nature. But there are different parts and planes of the subconscious also. Subconscious is, is one level, but there are also in the darkness there is a level, you see. If you go down below, it is like going down into the drain. Subconscious is like the drain. And when all the drains meet, well, it is a big pool of drain only, full of dirt and, and darkness. There you can have levels that something is higher and something is lower. Well, here he is pointing out that uh, there are different parts and planes of the subconscious. All upon earth is based on the inconscient as it is called, though it is not really inconscient at all, but rather a subconscient, a, a, see, an involved consciousness, in which there is everything, but nothing is formulated or expressed. The subconscious lies between the inconscient and conscious mind, conscious vital, conscious, uh, you know, uh, body. Between conscious mind, conscious life, and conscious physical being, and the inconscient, the subconscious lies between the two, connecting the two. It is like an ocean of, you know, dirt or darkness. It contains the potentiality of all the primitive reactions to life, which struggle out 
to the surface from the dull and inert strands of matter and form by a constant development a slowly evolving and self-formulating consciousness. It contains them not as ideas, not as perceptions, not as conscious reactions, but as a fluid substance of all these things. But also, all that is consciously experienced sinks down into the subconscious, not as precise though submerged memories, but as obscure yet obstinate impressions and experiences. And these can come up at any time as dream, as mechanical repetition of past thought, feelings, actions, etc., even as complexes, exploding into action and into event. The subconscious is the main cause why all things repeat themselves and nothing ever gets changed except in appearance. The subconscious persists and repeats and then whatever change you bring about, the subconscious again comes and governs it. All the changes in appearance, it is the cause why people say that character cannot be changed. The cause also of well, constant return of things one hoped to have conquered or got rid of forever. One thinks one has got rid of the thing, but it is, comes back again and again. Anger or an impression, you say, now I have conquered. Well, then suddenly you find it has come from where? It was hiding in the subconscious. The impression was lying there, waiting for an opportunity. As soon as it got the opportunity, it has come up from the depth of the subconscious. All seeds are there, and all impressions of mind, vital, and body are stored there. It is the main support of death and disease, and the last fortress which appears to be impregnable of the ignorance. If ignorance is to be conquered, well, the subconscious has to be made conscious. There is no other way. If one has to get rid of complete ignorance, he has to bring the light into the subconscious and make it conscient. All too that is suppressed without being wholly got rid of sinks down there and remains as seed ready to surge up or sprout at any movement. Uh, that part of the subconscious we have partly covered. Tomorrow we might take up the the psychic being and the remaining part of the subconscious, I think. Little bit of the subconscious is left and uh, we will take up the functioning of the, the, the psychic being tomorrow. So that uh, mind, vital being we have already done, then uh, you know the subconscious we have partly done and psychic being. So we know how these parts work in, in spiritual life and the, it would help us in spiritual effort if we know the, the differences and their level and their function. It is with that object that we are trying to pursue. The of the schema that I give you today also of the mind, the emotional being, the vital being, the nervous being and the physical being. Five main parts and of the five parts are different functioning and working. Then you can slowly, when you concentrate, uh, in the heart, you will be able then to perceive better, a little better, and in more in detail, you see, or in the mind, whatever the center of concentration, you will be able then to follow the, the movements that happen. Yoga means awareness. Yoga is growth of consciousness. Yoga is not miracles. <laughs> Yoga is growth of consciousness, being aware of what is happening in you every moment first. That will bring about a development by which you will be aware of a cosmic consciousness, of a divine consciousness. But first one must be aware of what is happening within oneself. Yoga means awareness, constantly growing awareness of what is happening within oneself. And that by knowledge of the planes and parts becomes easier to understand if one knows the distinction between life and mind, or vital being and mental being, emotional being and nervous being, nervous being and physical being, physical being and mental being, but it is easier than to act. For the day and the night. <laughs> <laughs> you bring the light into the subconscious. Is the, the way to bring the light into the subconscious through meditation, rather also other ways? And you see, the subconscious you can tackle very late in sadhana, not early. 
directly. But one can tackle subconscious when it expresses in mind or in life or in emotion. There you can tackle because it comes to the surface. It is like dirt that can rise from below. But when it comes, you can clear it where it comes. To change the place where the ocean of darkness or obstruction is working, that would be a long process. But whenever it comes up and surge up in the mind, for instance, idea that uh, I must be tired because I have worked very hard. It's not true. There's suggestion only. So when you get that feeling, you say, no, it's wrong. Now, in the saying wrong also, you must not go to the other extreme because your body has accepted the suggestion. Now, what happens is your mind is rejecting. But your body has for many years suggest, accepted the suggestion that if I work hard, I must be tired. Isn't it? Now, your mind has known that this is from the subconscious. So, mind says, no. Immediately, you should not put the whole of it into operation because your mind, body also is in the bargain. And it has its own subconscious movement and acceptance of it. So if you force the body with this mental idea, it might react again more. So what you have to do is to first put the mental idea clear in your mind and make it firm there. And put it on the vital first. If the vital accepts the life force, then vital can influence the body more easily than mind. Mind does influence also, but mind's influence is about 20-25%. Vital influence is 70-75%. Because vital says no, then the body will be obliged to accept the no more easily. Then you can say, all right, give the body a chance and say, all right, you are tired. Well, for this time I give you, but next time I am going to work hard. And you will see that body then begins to respond, not by a violent overcoming of its subconscious suggestion, but by a slow persuasion and the action of mental will and vital will. And if you can take the support of your psychic being, then it can be still more effective in rejecting the suggestion of the subconscious. That is how one has to work. Now, in established habits, people are addicted to tobacco eating or snuff or drink or smoke. Well, this is all samskar, all impression of the subconscious. It has no power except from the subconscious. So the body and the nervous system are to be tackled, that's all. But 90% of tackling is in the mind because mind admits all the subconscious movement. Oh, I can't do without smoke or I can't do without drink or I can't do without tobacco. Well, then naturally one can't do because the mind admits the impossibility. Then how can the, any other part do? It is with the mind that you begin to drive out your disease. You see, there's a funny thing that happened. When I was in Bombay, one of my friends was anxious and he said that you better get your heart examined. I was working naturally always as usual hard and so on. So he said, no, you must, now you must get your heart. I said, why? No, no, I want, all right, we went to a doctor. So he called in his doctor and then doctor asked, asked me, what is the matter? I said, yeah, that is for you to find out. I am the subject, I am the patient, is it not? I am like a watch. Now the watch, whether you have to find out whether the watch is working or not. He asked me, what, is, what happens? I said, no, that is for you to tell me what is the matter with my heart. So he said, no, you must tell me. Because our whole allopathic science depends upon symptoms, patients report, is it not? Patients report. So I said, no, I have a heart and you have to examine it like a watch. Whether the pumping is going on all right or not, you tell me. You see, no, he said, that is not the way, you must tell me. I said, all right. Then, doctor, I said, when the cure comes also, I will have to tell you. <laughs> Is it not? <laughs> when, when one day morning you come, then I say, now, doctor, I am all right. So, it is. <laughs> if I have to tell you I am not all right, 
It is I who will tell you I am all right. <laughs> <laughs> it is subjective, you see, that's it. That's how you cure, you see, that's how you cure yourself. You say, I am all right, and then you see uh, this imperson impartially, you observe the symptoms in the body also and say, how far the body is subject to the subconscious. You cannot neglect the body and override it and steamroller it. That's not possible because body is obstinate that way. But body also can be very pliant because body, in one sense, is, is very faithful to the psychic. You see, it is easily influenced by, by impression of the subconscious, but it has no desires. As we see, read yesterday, body knows its needs. Body knows what it requires. The man does not allow body to act independently of his desires. Therefore, body is ruled by, oh, I must have a headache. But a body has no headache. Oh, man will put the headache from his mind into his body. <laughs> it's like that. <laughs> so, you know, body can be very pliant and very, very obedient instrument if it is allowed to act. But if you override its normal functioning and its fixed impressions of subconscious, then it can revolt because the subconscious will work in it. You must eliminate the subconscious of the body, then body can become very pliant and very plastic instrument. Very plastic. The limits of bodily plasticity are very wide, very wide. Faithful servant of the spirit. Self can make well, the power of positive thinking, isn't it? A little different approach, you know, the power of positive thinking, you know. Mm. How, how, is, how does that operate? I don't know. Uh, I don't know either, excepting that it seems to make the, the mind so important. Yes. That I, and, and our will, and I think our yeah. will gets to Yes, it. yes, mental will. It can also operate through vital will. There is a system of cure by Dr. QA, Emil QA, which is well known, and uh, it was very successful, and QA was tackling the problem. It is called suggestion and auto-suggestion. By process of auto-suggestion, you get rid of this opposite suggestion of the subconscious. You see, even a man approached with a trouble, he used to say, day by day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. That's the way he gave him, you see. Now that put the will of the man into operation. And so the idea that I am not well was first tackled by the, by the suggestion. But the doctor put it with a great power. QA himself, Emil QA had a great power. Personally, he was a vitally very strong man, I think. I have not seen him, not know him, but he must have been a very strong man because the cases he cured were exceptionally miraculous cases. I mean, people walking with, uh, you know, rheumatic pain, Unable to bend down, well, used to kneel and uh, and go cured walking. People who came in carriages, you know, with a nervous trouble, and even one or two cases of paralysis, a real remarkable cure. I mean, they went back walking home. <laughs> they came. I know of two cases myself where this was done by mantric power, sciatica cure. You see, a man came to my friend. Uh, in a carriage and was not able to walk, you see, sciatic pain. So my friend was an allopathic doctor in Ahmedabad and he said that uh, in our allopathic science there is no cure for this. But he had heard that one man in a particular part of Ahmedabad cures this by, you know, occult treatment. So he gave me the address because he had taken the address. He said, go to this man and try him because we have no medicine. What's the use of your suffering? If you get cured, so far so good. And if you get cured, come and report to me, he said. So this man went to him. He was a carpenter. That man was a carpenter, but he was doing this because some yogi had given him, sadhu had given him this power and said that if you repeat this, well, the sciatic pain will go. So he didn't charge any money for that. That's the rule, that if you charge money, the power will go. So no money, it is free charge. He said you have to feed some poor people with so much. No, food and the dogs, you have to put some food to the dogs in the street 
and that's all right. There are dogs in the streets in India. Anyway. <laughs> so, well, he went and he, he was uh, three-fourths cured at the first contact. He simply passed his hand like that and said, you go home. He went home, 75% cured. He called him after two or three days. He was completely cured. And he walked back to my doctor friend and said, well, doctor, I'm all right. So my doctor friend got interested and said, well, I want to know. He went to that fellow and said, what did you do? He said, I have nothing. I have only a mantra with given my uh, sadhu has given, a yogi has given my guru. And I use it and it works. So he said, uh, does it require to believe in the mantra? He said, no, no. It is like any formula. It works. It works. <laughs> So even if you don't believe it will work. So he said, then can I take it? He said, yes, you can take it. So he took the formula according to the rule. That is science. Just it is like camera taking a snap. Then there are conditions. You can't say you give me unconditionally a picture. A camera condition is that there must be a black this, that and so on. And then you can take a picture. Otherwise, you can't take a picture. If you are a scientist, you pick a picture in the open, then scientists will say, no, it can't be done. There are conditions. So for this mantra also there are conditions. On a particular day, they have to go to a particular place and there only sit down at night, at midnight and this and that. And everything has to be done properly. Well, it was done. And my friend was able to cure sciatica afterwards. He was able to cure afterwards. The same on fire walking. Take place of fire walking. Walking on flames of fire. He, another doctor friend who was um, chief of the medical service in Baroda state. He didn't believe it. So he went with all picric acid and all bandages, you know. Well, the whole fire pit was prepared for officials of the state to walk upon. Fifteen feet by three. Fifteen long by three feet wide, fire was lighted in the compound of the palace of Baroda by the Maharaja. And uh, this man, Atashi, Professor Atashi from Burma came and uh, he said that uh, well, I'll make everybody walk on fire. So Dr. Suman did not believe in it. He said, it's all nonsense, point out. What nonsense? Everybody is burned. And he told his highness, please don't go. Let others go before. <laughs> 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 and he came with all bandages and piric acid to treat for burns and so on. This Arthur, she said, well, sir, you, what, you want to walk? Or you don't want to walk? He said, no, I want to walk, but I want to see others walk before me. I said, no, no. So he made the others walk before him. Then he said, yes, nothing seems to happen. So he examined everyone. Was there water? Was there this? All kinds of examinations. He found nothing was there. It was all right. Then he told him, sir, do you want to go with your socks or without socks? <laughs> 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 so now he thought that if the socks were there, he would get to real bar. He said, whether you go with sock or without sock, you won't get hurt. And now I give you, he gave him a garland of paper, you know, paper flowers. Paper flowers. And he said, now this will be burnt. You will not be hurt. You take in your hand. We went. It actually happened that the paper <laughs> garland got burnt and he came all right. <laughs> so he wrote an article in the Lynch set of 